that would be a reasonable uh, mm. estimate, of course. Mm. There's always uncertainty in this kind mm. of projection. Mm. But, you know, the real estate, I think, has been a negative, but mm. I, don't, I don't think it'll become any kind of serious crisis. Mm. And, Not a uh, serious crisis. Mm. So, mm. it's obviously a period of somewhat declining prices and even more mm. declining volume mm. of uh, transactions. Mm. Related to that, some slowdown in construction mm -hmm. related to uh, residential investment. Mm -hmm. um, so that contributes somewhat to the slower rate of economic growth, mm -hmm. but I don't expect any major uh, mm -hmm. problems there. Mm -hmm. Inflation outlook is pretty good. Uh, you mm -hmm. can see that from the financial markets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at some point interest rates will be uh, coming down, but uh, that depends somewhat on what mm -hmm. one sees in terms of the strength of the labor market and uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's clear the financial markets anticipate that uh, mm -hmm. rates will come down. Federal Reserve rate is five and a quarter percent now, and then mm -hmm. probably come down toward the four percent range. But this mm -hmm. will be over the next couple of years. Over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think it'll be a gradual process. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I think the best guess is the rates are about at their peak. But mm -hmm. For example, the labor market looked a lot stronger in this last report than people expected, so that goes somewhat in the other direction. And, uh, you see the inflation projections implicit in the financial markets are that the inflation rate won't be more than about 2%. Mm -hmm. So if it turned out to be different from that, that would have implications for monetary policy as well. Mm -hmm. How about more a broader picture? I mean, that the world economy, I think, uh, you said that U.S. economy is a bit uh, slowing down, I think, a more broader picture of the world economy of next year. Mm. You know, I think it will continue to be the case that the Asian mm. countries are the biggest uh, source of world economic growth. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, China and India being two big parts of mm -hmm. that, but not mm -hmm. just uh, mm -hmm. those countries. Mm. I'm not very optimistic about the longer run prospects in Western Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think they're likely to have even more mm -hmm. serious problems, mm -hmm. with it, really because of the underlying mm -hmm. policies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with some exceptions, I mean, the UK has been mm -hmm. sort of doing all right, and mm -hmm. Ireland is a small country, but it's mm -hmm. done quite well. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're well, speaking but, of... Um, you know, uh, Latin America has just mm -hmm. been a disappointment. Uh, mm -hmm. It looked pretty promising 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. But only Chile is really in good shape in Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, Mexico, maybe mm. be a sort of all right, mm. but it's a disappointing situation. Speak, speaking of world economy, one uh, big concern is that uh, there is so-called uh, global imbalance in the U.S. is, I think, that uh, continue to have, uh, I think, current account deficit mm. and also that uh, some fiscal deficit. And this deficit is uh, financed by the in the past, I think most of Japan. Well, that, that I think can make sense in my opinion. But now I think many Asian countries, developing countries like mm. China, I think that they, I think, uh, make a huge uh, current account surplus. With that money, they are supplying this uh, deficit of the United States. And mm. um, these, I think that, uh, so they are buying the U.S. Treasury bonds. So, in a sense, uh, China, or maybe in some part Korea and Japan, is financing this U.S. Uh, corona account deficit and so forth. So it, it, it has been a concern for many uh, experts. Uh, and yeah, isn't it quite uh, vulnerable or unstable? How, how, how long uh, does uh, this situation can continue, and uh, well, uh, you know, I think there's different mm. pieces of this. Mm. I think it's misleading to call it a twin deficit, okay? Because mm. I think the U.S. fiscal deficit is a very minor part of the oh, story. Yeah, now the fiscal deficit is very minor, okay? Um, Mm. And I don't think the current account deficit ever was reflecting the fiscal deficit in mm -hmm. the U.S. Okay. Uh, mm. You know, and as you say, the, the fiscal mm. deficit is almost gone now, mm. actually. It's virtually gone. Okay. Um, mm. But the current account deficit is mm. very large. And mm. in historical context, it's actually an unprecedented situation mm. Mm -hmm. for the U.S. to be running such a large current mm. account imbalance, 5-6% of the gross domestic yeah. product mm. for a period of five or six years. Mm -hmm. So that's a real puzzle as to mm. 
how does this happen, <laughs> why has this happened, why is it being sustained. Mm -hmm. As he suggests, a lot of it is being financed by this mm -hmm. accumulation of reserves. Mm -hmm. China has over a trillion dollars mm -hmm. now. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, Japan, mm -hmm. Korea, other, mm -hmm. even India has amassed uh, quite a bit. Um, so it's interesting that these countries are willing to do this. They sort mm -hmm. of have this thirst for these uh, mm -hmm. Low risk, relatively, but uh, yeah. not very rewarding forms of holding assets. And yeah. how long are they willing to yeah. do that is an interesting uh, yeah. question. So there are a lot of ideas that have been put mm. forward as to explaining mm. this phenomenon. I'm not mm. sure that mm. single one is uh, mm. correct. But I mean, in part, mm. the U.S. is exporting this paper, which is valuable. That the U.S. has <laughs> created this liquidity <laughs> instrument, which. Uh, yeah. Places have a demand for, so. uh -huh. and in some sense, you should count part of that yeah. as an export. Yeah. But I don't know that that accounts yeah. for the whole yeah. story, and you know yeah. why has it uh, mm -hmm. become so uh, immense? And yeah. I think part of the story is with respect to China that China yeah. is really supplying this vast amount of uh, mm -hmm. pretty good quality mm -hmm. goods at low prices, yeah. and it's a tremendous deal for the buyers, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. the U.S. And mm -hmm. I think that situation is temporary. Yeah. I don't think yeah. it's always going to be yeah. that. You've got these yeah. incredibly low-priced things, yeah. which certainly mm. compete with places like Mexico mm. and mm. Korea mm. from the point of view of exporting mm. stuff. Mm. So to the extent that that's temporary, it yeah. sort of makes sense that it would be yeah. financed in this mm. way if it's really mm. temporary. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the U.S. politicians mm. complain about mm. the low-priced Chinese products, yeah. mm. which from the standpoint of the U.S. consumer makes no sense, because you're... Mm standard of living is very much improved by having all these uh, low-priced quality goods uh, available and I think we should be happy with this probably temporary opportunity. So in some of these scenarios, the uh, current account imbalance will fix itself as this works out. And even if other forces are necessary, the market will sort of work this out by uh, adjustments in exchange rates and interest rates and stuff. So I think I think the biggest danger here is not the yeah. markets, but that the governments mm. will try to do something about the problem. Mm -hmm. And in the U.S., that would probably look like some kind of protectionism, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is more likely with a Democratic mm -hmm. Congress than it was the day mm -hmm. before we had a Democratic mm -hmm. Congress. So I think the real problem to worry about is that the governments may try to fix this problem. No. <laughs> in some sense. <laughs> Because it's, it's not a matter of saying, stop running a fiscal deficit. Yeah. So I think that's not really the issue. I think it would help some if the U.S. government was uh, more fiscally disciplined in the sense of the expenditures. Mm -hmm. But that's also a minor part of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a good idea, but I don't think it's the major uh, thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think if government want to intervene, uh, particularly uh, in terms of uh, protectionist movement, I think that that, that will be, I think, uh, a problem for the U.S. and then and the world economy. I agree. But, uh, but uh, well, even if I'm admitting that, I think, uh, are you agreeing with, with those some people that uh, this problem can be fixed? I think uh, where this is a temporary and then this can be p fixed, I think. <laughs> I think it has to be a temporary it problem that will be fixed yeah, because yeah. I can't see as part yeah. of our continuing equilibrium that the Asian yeah. countries will continue to amass such large amounts okay. of reserve. I think yeah. they're going to want to spend mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, it would also help if the U.S. would mm -hmm. allow foreign countries to buy more stuff in mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. So some recent restrictions mm -hmm. along that line uh, okay. from China and mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. Dubai ports world. Mm -hmm. Because that's also related to this. So, so those restrictions were also a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be fixed. Uh, yeah. and, and part of that may involve uh, mm -hmm. further real depreciation of the dollar mm -hmm. and also interest rate type yeah, adjustments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. well, but I certainly expect that the China currency mm -hmm. in real terms mm -hmm. will be appreciating mm -hmm. over the long term oh, as long as China will. keeps growing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be a very large appreciation in real mm -hmm. terms of the renminbi. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be stretched out over some yeah. substantial mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Well, you can... Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, let me uh, train, uh, turn uh, that the focus into Korea. Uh, I think that uh, you, you are, uh, are familiar with the Korean situation, but speaking of the Korean uh, economic uh, forecasting, KDI, as you know, that I think the most authentic 
uh, or uh, economic think tank has projected 4.3 percent of uh, uh, growth rate for next year. It is below from 5.0 percent from this year, so it is a bit uh, slowing down as like the United States and world economy. But still, there are additional risks. I said that as we know where there is, I think, a nuclear issue is still hanging around, and uh, we don't uh, produce oil, so may oil price maybe another additional. And uh, there are some exchange rate uh, risk. Of course, there are some upward um, risk and downward risk, but uh, what we are worried is more about, I think, uh, this uh, downward risk. Mm -hmm. So considering all these slowing down downward risk, and then many people in Korea have suggested government has to do some cyclical, counter-cyclical policy or so-called expansionary policy. So uh, they, they, they talk about uh, this uh, uh, the in fiscal expansion or monetary expansion. And uh, I know that you are a uh, very expert in the macroeconomic uh, uh, policies. So what, what in general I think that this, this macroeconomic adjustment policy in terms of fiscal expansion of our monetary expansion can can do counter this uh, cycle or I think economic slowing down. Is it effective or was it? You know, first I should mm. observe that mm. over the period up to the Asian financial crisis that yeah. Korea for quite a long time was mm. one of the fastest growing countries yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was predicted at that mm. time that you couldn't sustain per capita growth of five and a half, six percent okay. forever, that there is a normal kind of convergence mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. We'd expect the growth rate of mm -hmm. uh, real GDP per person to be uh, yeah. declining. And then, of course, there was the financial crisis, which was a mm -hmm. sharp downturn temporarily. Mm -hmm. And then growth picked up again after mm -hmm. that, but not as high as the level that it was at uh, mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. I think the main parts of government policy that are useful yeah. really have to do with this long-term economic growth. Long-term economic growth, okay. Think That's about right. it, That's foster right. long-term growth yes. that contribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the cyclical role of government policy, mm -hmm. I think, is mm -hmm. the useful mm -hmm. part is uh, much more limited. Mm -hmm. So in terms of monetary policy, mm -hmm. I think the best idea is to mm -hmm. be committed to something like low and stable inflation. Low and stable and inflation. not really try okay. to be manipulating interest rates to okay. prop up the economy when it's mm. weak and vice mm. versa. Mm. I don't think that's a useful role for uh, monetary mm. policy. Mm -hmm. I don't think it can be effective. Mm -hmm. uh, on the fiscal side, yeah. I think it's very counterproductive, particularly to try to use uh, mm -hmm. government expenditure in some cyclical sense in terms mm. of public projects. Mm -hmm. I think that's not proven to be effective with respect really to employment or uh, mm -hmm. economic growth. I think mm -hmm. you want to think about what's a useful mm -hmm. activity of the government in terms of public projects from a long-run yeah. growth mm -hmm. perspective. What okay. kind of public things are really sensible for the mm -hmm. government to be investing in? And mm -hmm. of course the institutions are mm -hmm. very important. That's mm -hmm. a very important role of government. Mm -hmm. uh, the regulation tax system is important in terms of long-run growth, but mm. very little of this is cyclical. I mean, it, it makes sense to have a cyclical thing where yeah. in recessions yeah. you might run more in the way of fiscal deficits. Mm -hmm. uh, and related to that, that tax rates might be somewhat lower than normal in a recession, mm -hmm. but that would be a very mild kind of okay. typical counter-cyclical mm -hmm. uh, response, not mm -hmm. that kind of, I think, Mm -hmm. public works things that uh, some mm -hmm. people have suggested, which I think are not very mm -hmm. uh, effective. I mean, my general yeah. impression was that the Korean uh, policy was more pro-growth, yeah. capitalistic, mm -hmm. in the period up till, uh, I don't know, 1996 or mm -hmm. so, and uh, mm -hmm. since then has been less so and has mm -hmm. been more concerned with things like income redistribution okay. and social yeah. welfare. And, mm -hmm. I think that that's harmful. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's harmful to the representative person in the economy. Okay. I think the earlier view, I think, mm -hmm. was a better one. So I think one can think about the kinds of uh, yeah. market-friendly, business-friendly mm -hmm. policies that would be mm -hmm. uh, growth-promoting. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I would uh, mm -hmm. argue for, not the counter-cyclical stuff. 
So if I understand it correctly, I think in terms of I think uh, monetary policy, I think that the uh, uh, policy target should be I think maintain this low and stable inflation that is a top priority, and then right, and then this uh, the government expenditure. I think that uh, we should be uh, very careful. I think that. Uh, if you try to use it as a counter uh, cyclical measure, there are some some uh, counter uh, products. So maybe uh, there are maybe some tax uh, adjustment can be possible, but that's still I think uh, uh, it may not be. I think that uh, uh, very I think that uh, correcting the whole problem is. Uh, but here in Korea, I think that, that the related issue here is that. Uh, uh, the people perceive this as a recession, or they, they, we are in a bad situation, and then they are asking everything, not just, I think, counter-cyclical. Uh, I think they, uh, they are saying that they mix this structural uh, regulation with the counter-cyclical and the vice versa. For example, uh, people are saying, because we are in bad time, because we are in recession, so we have to change this uh, regulation about the corporate governance, for example. We have to change the uh, regional balance uh, development regulation. Uh, it is so-called metropolitan area control. And the other example is they want to cure these structural issues. I think that this real estate, I think, uh, market here is there are some structural problems in Korea. And then somebody is suggesting that uh, since that uh, we have to cure this real estate market with the interest rate, so there is even this uh, newspaper uh, is suggesting that uh, or the discussing maybe uh, we have to increase this interest rate. So with all these, I think that uh, uh, complex suggestion about this uh, where government actions. So uh, something like this example happened just about a month ago uh, that people was deeply involved in monetary expansion because of this nuclear, I think, the shock. So monetary expansion, and that means uh, maybe interest rate uh, uh, lowering. And then just about three weeks after this, uh, the yesterday, and that they are talking about this interest rate increase, the possibility because of that, uh, this real estate market. So th there is a lot of uh, confusion, I think. And, uh, is it now? You know, in a general way, yeah. it's very common to have this yeah. kind of yeah. political economy type commentary, yeah. uh, but it takes different forms yeah. in different countries and different okay. times. Mm. I mean, in the United States mm. now, this similar kind yeah. of sentiment would show up mm. as protectionist arguments. Yeah. You know about how we have to save jobs by mm. preventing the flow of cheap Chinese mm. goods or something. Mm. We want to have some big tariff. Mm. Now that's not exactly the same thing as what mm. you're saying people are arguing mm. for in Korea, mm. but it's equally uh, mm -hmm. badly informed with mm. respect to how the overall economy functions mm. and what's good for mm. overall uh, economic growth. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the mm. real estate market uh, yeah. In Korea, mm -hmm. to say what I think would be useful uh, mm -hmm. structural reforms, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying there might not be some mm -hmm. useful reforms, mm -hmm. but I don't think you'd want to really think about those changes in the context of uh, right now and what can mm -hmm. you do to uh, get out of a contractionary economic period. Mm -hmm. You need to think about that in a more long run mm -hmm. structural sense as to yeah. what's a well functioning credit market yeah. and what regulations are appropriate, yeah. specifically related to, to yeah. housing. Um, so that's what I mean by the perspective of policies that work well for long-run economic mm. performance are the ones that are going to be well-founded. Yeah. But often that will be counter to public opinion that uh, moves around mm. a lot and, uh, mm. you know, and this sentiment about how you got to do something right now mm. because somebody's suffering and so and so. Mm. And then you don't worry about what the other consequences are from that. Mm. Uh, one of the problems with respect to increasing government expenditure mm. uh, during recessions is that you never get rid of that expenditure. You just end up with larger governments. Mm. And larger governments tend to be negative for economic yeah. progress. It's yeah. not a positive. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to have governments doing things only if you can justify the activity in terms of really the productivity mm -hmm. of the public investment and okay. in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the one government could be involved in certain things. And, 
particularly education and health are uh, important areas there. But the justification for the involvement has to be that what the government is doing is really productive. It's not that it's some device for fighting unemployment. That's the part that I think doesn't follow. You mentioned this importance of, I think, a long run uh, growth potential way. With regard to that, uh, as you know, that as you have already mentioned, Korea experienced that uh, eight to nine percent growth rate, I think, in the 1980s, and then over seven to eight percent in early part of 1990s. But in recent years, the average growth rate is in from 1996 to 2000 uh, is about 4.3 percent. At that period, we had a foreign exchange crisis, but coming into 21st century, uh, it is again the average on a 4.4 uh, percent uh, level. So you mentioned uh, maybe as uh, the economy matures, maybe uh, it is a bit uh, a part of natural thing, but on the on the other hand, when you compare this island, there was a, it is an advanced economy in Singapore, and our number is smaller, I think maybe about a half percent smaller than that. So, so mid, I think, uh, lower 4 percent level or mid 4 percent level, maybe I think, uh, I don't think there is a magic number, but, but as my question is, so is it current Korea's long-term uh, growth, potential growth rate is, is quite a natural phenomenon of the mature economy, or as I said, uh, compared with our comparable countries is uh, a bit lower, we need much things to do? Or is it? Mm. Well, as usual, in terms of thinking about determinants of growth, there's not yeah. just one thing uh -huh. that explains it. But, yeah. uh, I did do a... Yeah forecast for Korea. I think if you look at the period 1960 to mm. 2000 even, which includes the mm. financial crisis, mm -hmm. so the average growth rate mm. per capita for South Korea over mm. that period was I mm. think around 5.5% That's okay. per capita. Mm -hmm. uh, of course the population growth mm. rate has come mm. down a lot mm. from what it used to mm. be. So that may have translated mm. into 7.5% mm. for the level mm. of uh, GDP. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I remember doing a projection based mm -hmm. on a kind of normal pattern mm -hmm. of tending to slow down when you got richer mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other factors. Mm -hmm. So as I recall, it was a projection for Korea of, of about 35 to 4% per capita growth okay. per capita. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got to add the population okay. growth mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. that. That was the kind of number that would be kind of the normal slowdown because of having gotten richer. I see. That's yeah. sort of the normal. Now that doesn't mean it, it always fits exactly by no means. Yes. Yeah. But given that pattern, there are other things that can be mm -hmm. done in terms of policies and institutions that can make the growth rate higher or lower than that. Mm -hmm. And I say I don't think that of late that uh, mm -hmm. Korean policy has been particularly pro-economic growth. Mm -hmm. So I think there are things that could have been done to offset this natural okay. tendency yeah. to slow down. But there is this force yeah. eventually. I mean, yeah. uh, Korea is still less than, uh, depending on which numbers you use, maybe about half of the yeah. U.S. level in terms of per capita GDP, mm -hmm. uh, something on that order, yeah. depending on which yeah. numbers you mm -hmm. look at. Um, mm -hmm. So that's some suggestion about there's still a considerable amount of room for convergence yeah. Uh, yeah. to the U.S. level, mm -hmm. but not nearly as much as what it would have been in 1960. So, mm -hmm. so that does project some of slowdown, yeah. but uh, I think the uh, yeah. government could have policies that are yeah. more pro-growth in terms of the nature of uh, the yeah. labor market regulations, for example. Yeah. Um, Possibly things that are being done with respect to education, okay. particularly yeah. the quality of schooling, maybe yeah. a bigger role of the private yeah. sector uh, yeah. Yeah. for making that more efficient. I think yeah. there are things that could okay. be done that are better or worse, and yeah. that would go on top of this normal yeah. convergence force. Yeah. So uh, you, know, I think, uh, convergence in terms of I think converging to the like, advanced nations, I think, uh, status. So. Uh, you uh, already mentioned that like, uh, some uh, uh, factors there, and then also uh, I heard you are, I think, uh, uh, closing obvious, I think, determinants of growth, and then you, you mentioned, I think, uh, particularly at your address about the, the education factor, but but uh, uh, I will come back to the education later, but, but in, in general, I think, so what we should do, 
I mean, Korea should uh, to promote, I think, long-term growth potential. And uh, where there is an institution where the, the pro productivity related, or some people uh, is addressing or looking at this capital, or the factor accumulation in capital or labor. So uh, could you be more specific on that? So in terms of, I think, uh, your determinants of growth uh, uh, theory, I think, as you said, I think we are, we, we, we are more focused on economic growth than uh, what components uh, can you suggest? Well, I think not only productivity growth mm -hmm. matters, but also accumulation of factors okay. uh, still matters, although that can be slowing down in terms okay. of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. So the quality of human capital is one of the factors. Quality of I human think about capital. that as okay. a factor of production. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Physical capital still matters, and mm. Uh, mm. saving rate certainly matters to some extent Savings in terms rate, okay. of that. I mean, mm. the saving rate has typically been mm. pretty high in uh, mm. South Korea, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. I mean, it could be too high mm. also mm. in terms of mm -hmm. But I, I think the factor accumulation still matters, even mm -hmm. though it might become increasingly less of a okay. contributor compared with mm. productivity mm. Uh, enhancements. Mm -hmm. I mean, the competition with, uh, for example, China and export markets might be a negative. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing, I think, uh, mm -hmm. that one can do about that from the standpoint of uh, mm -hmm. Korea, except to mm -hmm. try to be more productive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the past, I thought it was important for Korea to open uh, more in terms of international ownership, especially okay. in the financial sector. Oh, international uh, ownership in the financial sector. You no, know, it had been a problem in the past in terms of the government uh, favoring certain financial institutions mm -hmm. and requiring certain mm -hmm. kinds of industrial loans mm -hmm. from the banks. And, mm -hmm. uh, I had thought it was um, it, that there would be less of that if there were more strong foreign financial institutions mm -hmm. that were important in, uh, mm -hmm. in Korea. So I, I thought opening, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of course, there's been a significant amount mm -hmm. of that, but I thought that that was a, mm -hmm. a favorable mm -hmm. stand. I mean, that's sort of part of this general idea of uh, international openness. It's just mm -hmm. another dimension of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this idea of this uh, East Asian mm -hmm. currency union eventually mm -hmm. could be something productive for mm -hmm. further promoting mm -hmm. trade among the uh, countries. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think, for instance, China has now become more important than the U.S. as a trading partner. Mm -hmm. For South Korea, and I think that mm. that will be increasingly so. And uh, mm. you'd expect more with respect to some of the other Asian economies, Japan, mm. India, mm. for example. Mm. So, in line with that, and mm. uh, of course, um, mm. free trade in, in goods and uh, yeah. financial services is mm. one idea. But one could go further in terms mm. of uh, integrating financially, in terms of possibly having a common currency at okay. some point. I don't think it's an immediate policy mm. prescription. Okay. But I see it being realistic if mm. one looks a few years down the road, particularly when China has moved fully to mm. being financially mm. open uh, in mm. terms of having a convertible currency and a mm -hmm. fully open financial sector. Mm. This uh, idea of the currency union, East Asian currency union, and this uh, even not to that extent, form, uh, some form of cooperation, like the financial cooperation in East Asian countries, uh, was, I think, uh, hotly debated after the foreign exchange crisis. And then uh, there comes out a so-called Chiang Mai Initiative or some uh, format of a corporation currency swap. And, but uh, again, some people are saying about this is political uh, environment. So particularly this uh, the, uh, rivalry between this Japan and uh, China. So, so, but if you are saying about currency union, then uh, are you visioning something like a euro or at least some in the uh, midterm range? Yeah. I think down the road, yes, I was thinking of something that, uh, like a euro. So probably okay. a new currency rather than any okay. existing uh, yes. uh, I don't think of that as an immediate yeah. policy change, but yeah, I think okay. it's realistic if one looks yeah. uh, further. You know, this idea of rivalry. Yeah. You know, on one hand you can say rivalry, yeah. on the other hand you can say okay. competition. Yeah. So if you say competition, yeah. economists think that that's a nice word. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure in that sense you really want cooperation mm -hmm. among okay. governments. Mm -hmm. Cooperation, another word for that looks like monopoly, so that doesn't sound yeah. so pleasant. 
So I'm really thinking about having more uh, mm. openness in terms of the financial flows. Okay. And of course, China is an important part mm. of that. They've mm. been liberalizing, but only mm. slowly. Mm -hmm. But the kind of cooperation I could envision uh, down the road is uh, being productive is this common currency mm -hmm. idea, the sort of euro for uh, Asia, if you like. Okay. I don't know what the right uh, yeah. name is supposed to be for the new money, but yeah. uh, I could see that as, as a useful trade mm -hmm. promotion device. Now, in terms of the euro, mm -hmm. I think it's been successful at promoting trade in goods okay. and services yeah. and financial flows. Mm -hmm. But there has also been a lot of conflict uh, mm. involved with trying to ma have a single currency, a single mm. monetary policy. Mm. And I think part of the problem is they also wanted a single fiscal policy and they wanted sort of common uh, social policies. Mm. I don't favor any of that. I don't mm. think that that's a positive, uh, to have that kind of integration. That can actually promote more conflict. Yeah. I think the single money itself in Europe has been a pu mm. plus. Mm. But it's come with other baggage, which okay. I think is not such a plus, which is, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. if I'm looking at it correctly, mm -hmm. is a useful lesson mm -hmm. for what might be good to design mm -hmm. in an East Asian context. Mm -hmm. uh, well, with regard to the trade issue, I think that, as you know, I think Korea, particularly Korea, uh, is development dependent on so-called this outward-looking strategy, and then we has benefited a lot from that this world trading system. <coughs> But at the same time, Koreans, particularly these days, uh, they have a lot of reluctance, I think, uh, in whatever form, I think, in, in even in DDA, or Development Agenda, or FTA, I think that there is a quite a uh, resistance. And, uh, and uh, we are negotiating our rights uh, with Korea, uh, with the United States free trade agreement, uh, and there are a lot of activist uh, demonstrators is there. And then, there is a saying that uh, in Korea that uh, after NAFTA, this, that uh, Canada and Mexico and even the United States have become worse off. So, so that's the reason we are, uh, so we are objecting this Korea US FTA. So please very be simple and punctual. I said, what, what is uh, your recommendation to the Korean government and uh, the, the Korean people? about this uh, that foreign trade or liberalization issue and particularly about uh, Korea US FTA. Mm. Mm. Of course, I'm very much in favor of uh, yeah. expanding trade opportunities and yeah. having mm -hmm. system closer to mm -hmm. free trade. Mm -hmm. The argument about NAFTA with respect to Mexico yeah. is really puzzling because I think Positive, NAFTA is yeah. about the only thing that saved Mexico. Because yeah. Mexico, other than NAFTA, mm. has had very bad policies. Okay. And basically, uh, had mm -hmm. almost no functioning financial mm -hmm. system after mm -hmm. the 95, 96 okay. Uh, okay. situation. So mm -hmm. I think the thing that kept them mm -hmm. sort of doing reasonably well mm -hmm. was the great expansion of mm -hmm. uh, exports mm -hmm. re uh, related to NAFTA. Mm -hmm. For the U.S., I think it's harder to show mm -hmm. whether the effect was positive or yeah. negative. I, mm -hmm. I think the effect is just not that big for the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. Having the mm -hmm. free trade with Mexico, and mm -hmm. it was not such a big change with respect mm -hmm. to Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think for the United States, it's hard to prove. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, but as you were saying about the political opposition to further mm -hmm. uh, free trade in uh, Korea, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is analogous with that, particularly over the long history yeah. that free trade has been very important for the United States, in mm -hmm. terms of the early development mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. And then during the Great Depression and, and the war mm -hmm. period, uh, mm -hmm. the trade uh, sort of went down dramatically. Mm -hmm. It was a very poor uh, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And it's expanded a lot in the post-World War II period in the mm -hmm. U.S. Of course, it's not nearly so much mm -hmm. in relation to the economy as for mm -hmm. Korea or mm -hmm. other places, because the U.S. is such a big economy. Yeah. It's not surprising that most of the trade is domestic within the mm -hmm. uh, country. Mm -hmm. But still, I think overall, we've certainly benefited from the expansion of trade okay. uh, in mm -hmm. the post-World War II mm -hmm. period. And uh, NAFTA is a part of that. Mm -hmm. But then you find opponents to it who, mm -hmm. I mean, some people are harmed uh, mm -hmm. by that. and. Particularly, it's uh, high wage union labor in some sectors in the United States. Who union are, labor. Uh, armed yeah. High wage union labor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a yeah. lot of the opposition comes from there and it's yeah. translated now, particularly through the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which is a little ironic because it was Clinton as president who really pushed uh, NAFTA mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. uh, Clinton was much more of a pro markets person, mm -hmm. including uh, free trade, mm -hmm. but the Democrats mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. U.S. are not like that at mm -hmm. all. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, today. Mm -hmm. So it's analogous, I think, to the kind of opposition mm -hmm. you mentioned in mm -hmm. Korea to mm -hmm. uh, further trade expansion. Mm -hmm. And you get that kind of uh, mm -hmm. political economy. And it is true that certain sectors mm -hmm. that are benefiting from the protectionism are going to be especially vocal in this. Mm -hmm. But for the economy as a whole, mm -hmm. it tends to be that it benefits from the further uh, mm -hmm. trade liberalization. Mm -hmm. So I certainly would favor the free trade agreement between uh, Mm -hmm. South Korea and the U.S., but okay. I would not be very optimistic about the U.S. Congress in terms of approving this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be more yeah. difficult than it has mm -hmm. been. Uh, mm -hmm. It's already was difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think in your favor, I think that Korea-U.S. Uh, FTA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I definitely. I definitely, yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. The uh, so you. Uh, your description about that uh, Korean, I think, economic policy is more leaned toward uh, inequality, or I think income distribution rather than economic growth. But, but again, I think that uh, it's the fact in the world and in Korea also as this uh, globalization and uh, some hard uh, digitalization, digital. Uh, it's a knowledge-based economy is uh, uh, coming in, but uh, there is a growing tendency, where I said, uh, at least in the international right, of uh, income uh, disparity increase. So how, how do we cope with uh, this, this problem? How do we handle these uh, inequality issues? And uh, it's a, yes, yeah. it is very, I think, that a very sensitive, and then there is not a solution I can understand. But uh, what is? Your no, of course, this issue is much uh, more mm. acute in a place like China than it China is, is in acute, okay. South Korea. Mm -hmm. And one of their paramount mm. policy problems is going to be how to deal with the urban rural disparity, All <coughs> which China. has really okay. been uh, expanding. I mean, mm. along with overall mm. progress, mm -hmm. including in the rural area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So part of that in the China context, mm -hmm. I think, is about further uh, mm -hmm. mobility from the rural to the urban mm -hmm. uh, parts, mm -hmm. uh, getting rid of some restrictions related to movement and mm -hmm. uh, related to using educational mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So compared to that issue, mm -hmm. I find it surprising that it's a paramount issue in South Korea because, uh, <laughs> of course, you don't have anything like the inequality in Korea that you have in China, which mm -hmm. has, in China, it's also increased a lot okay. over the last 30 yeah. years or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it's that uh, in order to get expression to be, uh, mm. in opposition to what's going on, people mm. can't really be that poor. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, when it's less inequality, maybe there's more uh, debate, uh, complaint about it, because the people are more able to make the kinds of uh, complaints. Mm. <clears throat> you know, contrasted with China, where the poor people are don't have much of a voice, and, mm. and they're in rural areas and it mm -hmm. just don't have as much influence, even though the problem is really much more serious. Mm -hmm. There may be, I think, uh, a few reasons, I think. I, I agree with you, as, in, as uh, talking about this international comparison, I think that our situation in terms of, I think, the income distribution is much better than Latin America, where I said, well, where? Well, better, right. better than China and better than the, even the United States, I think. That, but the people quite in recently, it's not just the government, or, or I'm emphasizing, it's not just the government. The people <coughs> are, are very much interested in that issue. Maybe a couple of uh, reasons is that, uh, maybe it's one is that after the foreign exchange crisis, at that time I there is a huge, I think, uh, unemployment and so some, some increasing. So the number is, uh, for example, the Gini coefficient ha has been increased a little bit, and that is one thing. And the other is that, or I so you you uh, have shown this Kuzinets curve, but I think maybe people think that as our economy has grown and uh, we are now enough to have some uh, food, so maybe I think uh, we need some more welfare. I think that that is people's expectation. The third and more important reason is that before 1997, we almost literally didn't have any social safety network. I think that is even compared to this uh, developing countries. So from uh, that time, 1998, I think we begin to build up this 
social welfare system, particularly government funded. So the speed, the speed of increasing this burden is increasing, so that this caused uh, a lot of attention. So when we talk about the absolute level, I think that the government expenditure in general is not quite high, but, but the increasing burden is uh, very, I think that uh, uh, to a high extent. But, but anyway, anyway, I think that uh, you're right. From, from the outsider's viewpoint, I think uh, maybe peoples, not just the government, is uh, too much oriented in, in that uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right in general mm -hmm. that yeah. as places get richer, yeah. that the demand for these social safety net programs uh, okay. increases. Mm -hmm. And you can certainly see that in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are pretty rich countries with not a lot of uh, income mm -hmm. inequality mm -hmm. in a comparative mm -hmm. sense across countries. Mm -hmm. But there are the places with the biggest mm -hmm. uh, social safety nets where mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of government expenditure mm -hmm. as a share of the GDP mm -hmm. going to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that fits with the process yeah. that you're witnessing mm -hmm. in uh, Korea, mm -hmm. that as it got richer, mm -hmm. Uh, that even though the poor were brought up as part of that process, yeah, the yeah. demand, partly through the political process, mm -hmm. for more social insurance going mm -hmm. through the government mm -hmm. uh, expanded. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think it's a reasonable thing to try to think of what's a relatively efficient way of having kind of social safety net uh, mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. whether in terms of uh, pension mm -hmm. or uh, unemployment mm -hmm. insurance mm -hmm. or uh, health care type mm -hmm. uh, programs. And those are definitely the areas where the mm -hmm. Western European countries have mm -hmm. had the biggest problems mm -hmm. because those programs are extraordinarily inefficient mm -hmm. okay. and I think tend to propel long-term mm -hmm. unemployment mm -hmm. being high. Mm -hmm. So then there are lessons from that mm -hmm. to what one would do in terms of designing such programs if mm -hmm. you know, one has the opportunity to be making changes there, which yeah. is probably easier here than in Western Europe to make yeah. changes mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I think you you have uh, I I heard that your closing address you have uh, already enough mentioned about it is uh, human resource development and education in your uh, address and then question and answer session. But uh, I'd like to ask uh, once more, what what do you think is the findings of this seminar about the human resources development? What are the key points? Well, what, what do you think is the key points and what uh, will be needed, particularly in Korean education system, uh, in view of the theme of uh, this uh, seminar. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think a clear theme is that yeah. the quality of uh, education is, quality. is yeah. central. Mm -hmm. But that's a key ingredient mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. human capital in mm -hmm. terms of underlying uh, mm -hmm. productivity. Mm -hmm. So there, I think one wants to think about the efficiency mm -hmm. of the uh, educational system. Okay. You know, and as in some other areas, there yeah. seems to be a conflict there with this uh, equality notions. Okay. Because I think it's been pushed more and more in Korea that basically, especially at the elementary and secondary levels, but mm. even beyond that, that, mm. uh, that there's supposed to be everybody getting basically the same thing mm -hmm. in terms of schooling. Okay. And moreover, that um, mm. almost all of that is supposed to be provided by the government. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real efficiency uh, problem mm -hmm. there. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, it's not going to be right that uh, it's going to be productive for everybody to get almost the same thing. Okay. And secondly, you can probably have a much more efficient product if uh, one uses the market more, uh, mm -hmm. the private sector, mm -hmm. to be producing mm -hmm. some of this educational mm -hmm. input. Now, I think in Korea, a lot of people do that on the side, mm -hmm. not the official yeah. uh, system, okay. but through these cramming schools and yeah. such, which is kind of a yeah. privately provided uh, okay. supplement. Mm -hmm. But that process itself, as mm. I've not researched it in detail, but from mm. what I've heard, it seems to be a very mm -hmm. large user of resources. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be all that uh, mm -hmm. uh, efficient. Um, so as I mentioned uh, during the conference, I thought it would be good to employ mm. more in the way of private uh, production yeah. of okay. uh, education, even mm. when accompanied by public financing. Yeah. That's the school choice idea, which I think mm. is a very sound uh, concept. The key issue here is that uh, this uh, war, I think uh, almost I think every people I think uh, agrees that the quality of education or creativeness of education is uh, very important. As 
but at the same time still this opportunity for uh, for uh, for uh, getting this education uh, should should be also put emphasis particularly some people view this as an uh, some other generation of inheritance of that the poor and rich so so the uh, the government the country needs to give at this at this I think that the vast or I shouldn't say equal but I think that the, as many opportunities that are for for the, for the nation so is it quite a contradictory uh, thing these two goals or can can you find some very good compromise or so maybe maybe some people here is that this is a completely I think that uh, contradictory uh, target. So maybe some people are think, thinking that we, we have to give some same, same, exactly same level of education or the same thing. Or are there any, some compromise? I think that may be the key issue here. Well, the school choice concept is a compromise because yeah. it basically accepts the school idea, choice, okay, yeah. particularly at the elementary school in okay. mm. that this is a public uh, mm -hmm. good, a public activity. Yeah. But then the uh, answer to that is that the government should be paying for it, financing oh, it, paying it, but not necessarily mm -hmm. producing the product. Or I at see. least that one should be very open mm -hmm. to private alternatives, private competition. Mm -hmm. So the government would still be paying or mm -hmm. paying the main part of this. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the government should have a monopoly in the provision, because the government is probably not yeah. very good at that. It's certainly true in the United States, yeah. the government is not very good. Mm -hmm. So then there's an argument, partly philosophical, about whether this Mm. public good aspect, does it just go through elementary school mm. or does it include all of mm. secondary school, does it include college and mm. such? And one has to think about why one believes that this is a public good in the first place rather mm. than a kind of usual kind of private mm. good. And I think the argument is strongest at the elementary level but mm. you know could be made further up. Mm -hmm. So whatever one decides on that score, I think that's more about financing mm. and expenditure than it is about production. Okay. So that's why I think the school choice uh, mm. idea is, is actually consistent with the quality of opportunity, opportunity mm. in terms of access to in school. Terms of access, okay. But it's still, it doesn't uh, conclude mm. from that that the government should be the major producer. Okay, okay thank you. I, I think I have covered uh, most of what I have intended, but uh, I want to uh, lastly, I think, confirm you and uh, there are people, if there is addition, additional, uh, I think you have to ask a question, but additional I think we covered the points that I had thought about uh, mm. beforehand and mm. been discussing. Okay. Well, what particular what do you want Mm. Hi. Mm. So, <clears throat> actually, I'm preparing for your um, mm. article about you. Mm. So I'm just asking a soft, soft question. Like, mm. uh, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Finally, it's not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope you uh, you said uh, religious countries is uh, is um, <clears throat> positive to for your economic growth, right? Really. Religion, re religious mm -hmm. people? Um, not and necessarily. But I mean, we have some findings, but there's a distinction in those findings between mm -hmm. religious beliefs and religious participation. Mm -hmm. Of course, they do tend to go together, yeah. mm -hmm. but you can also, to some extent, separate mm -hmm. the two. So, I mean, our finding was that if you look overall at places that are more or less religious, there's really not much relationship mm -hmm. to economic growth. Mm -hmm. We had some results that... Uh, Greater beliefs, certain kinds of beliefs, particularly related to afterlife and such, were uh, conducive to growth. But we found that spending more time and resources on religion uh, in and of itself was a negative. It seemed to be a drag on uh, economic activity. So there was some subtlety in, in the results, you know, as well as controversy about whether the results are correct. Then, um, in the so I mean, in that context, for instance, yeah. the Muslim countries show up as being the most religious. Muslims and evangelical groups are the most religious in terms of uh, religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Muslim countries overall in terms of economic growth, uh, they're about average. They're not, they're not worse than average. They're actually about average overall. So in this perspective, 
uh, we would have a very strong set of religious beliefs, some of which would be conducive to productivity and some not, but also a lot of free sources and time being expended. And that would be a negative. So that might be consistent with this pattern where uh, they have an average rate of performance. Uh, in some places, it's been argued that uh, evangelical groups are especially productive. And uh, mm -hmm. like in Latin America, uh, even in Korea, mm -hmm. there's the argument about people liking to hire uh, evangelicals because they show up for work on time and they don't drink too much and all this stuff. So that's related to some of these uh, religion mm -hmm. patterns. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. But it's dangerous too, <laughs> no. because easily you yeah. <laughs> can. Then, um, well, if you think about beliefs, mm. afterlife beliefs, and in, in some contexts it can motivate work effort and productivity and honesty. Mm -hmm. But in other contexts, the same beliefs might uh, motivate terrorism. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And it can, under, it can explain mm. why terrorism would be, because this, these are very powerful forces. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if they're directed in the wrong way, they can underpin some very mm. negative forms of behavior. That's why it's not mm. so simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, this is my main question, but what do you think about the uh, book named um, Moral Consequences of Economic Growth, which Benjamin Frank, uh, Friedman yeah, wrote? Well, how do you evaluate that book? It's <laughs> 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 not, not an easy or yeah, light it's question. It's a surprising, surprising <laughs> question. <laughs> I mean, there's been a lot of research yeah. over the last 15 years about mm -hmm. what matters for growth, mm -hmm. what are the determinants and such. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that this was a book that was a major contributor within that vein. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was more about sort of talking at a popular level, thinking about uh, mm -hmm. institutions, cultures, and mm -hmm. attitudes that uh, can either support or detract from growth. I, I didn't think it was really intended as a kind of contribution to academic research uh, on this field. Okay. It's not fair to ask me what do I think about some work of one of my colleagues. Okay, thank you uh, right, very thank much. You. And then as I said, I think next time you visit uh, Korea, yeah. please yeah. I try Let's to drop by Shadia.